conflict theory is really an idea that originated with Marx and this idea of class conflict, but now has been built upon by a range of contemporary theorists to talk about conflicts that exist based on social differences and really categories of social difference. And often those different categories are defined by different access to material resources or different levels of access and levels of material resources. Um, so I'm going to talk briefly about Karl Polanyi, who's already been mentioned, and who's actually a bit more straightforward, and then talk also briefly about Bourdieu, who is less straightforward. Um, but Karl Polanyi is uh, a bit of a bridge, maybe, between classical and contemporary theory. He um, was born in Hungary, in the, or he was born in Austria, but he's Hungarian in the late 1800s. Um, his sort of seminal work is a book called The Great Transformation, which he actually wrote at Bennington College in the US in Vermont, which is sort of interesting. He, like many thinkers, I guess, at the end of the 1800s in Europe, um, fought in World War I and then made his way west. So he went, went from Hungary to Austria to the UK and eventually to the US. And he ended up um, his professional career as a professor of economics at Columbia University. Um, I don't really know, he has a law degree, so again, he's a, this sort of classical social thinker whose, whose disciplinary background doesn't necessarily uh, help identify where they ended up. Um, but his ideas are really um, trying to articulate alternative understandings of alternative economic systems. And so um, the Great Transformation focuses on maybe not the political economy of World War I and II, but more like political economy in the context of World War I or World War II. So trying to understand how the world in this um, capitalistic system that had been hypothesized to create great stability ended up in two world conflicts in the space of 20 years uh, or 30 years. Um, and the basic, one of the key ideas in the Great Transformation is this idea of the double movement, which I think Tom alluded to earlier. Um, and it really comes out of this idea of, um, it, in this frame of the conflict school, the idea that the self-regulating market in fact creates differences, social differences based on material realities, and that those differences will create conflict. Um, and then uh, sort of as a corollary to that, uh, that the, the internal logic of the capitalist system is to maximize efficient use of inputs. And so if labor in particular is one of those inputs, the, the maximal efficient use of individual labor will lead to social exploitation. That is socially not acceptable for moral or legal or, or stability reasons, right? Um, and so there actually need to be law, politics, and morality that kind of condition a self-regulating market. So a, a fully self-regulating market uh, with no kind of limits or bounds or other kinds of structures would actually self-destruct. It would both um, consume all of the, all of the inputs or the mo all the inputs to production and it would be socially uh, sort of devastating and create a, a bit of a, a sort of state of chaos. So he had this idea of the double movement as the back and forth between the logic of the market playing out in the social space and society reacting to the negative impacts of that logic and therefore creating new types of structures and institutions. Um, and so moving from some of those ideas uh, about what are those institutions and those structures that are built to kind of counteract these negative externalities, his other main contribution that came a bit later in life when he was in the United States in an economics department was the idea of substantive economics. And it's actually been taken up a lot more by economic sociologists and anthropologists, um, although it was sort of generated uh, in, a, in a sort of more neoclassical economic space. Uh, but the idea of substantive economics is that economy broadly is an instituted process of interaction between man and his environment. And this is part of why I think Polanyi is a really interesting theorist to use in the socio-environmental space because I think he was, a lot of, a lot of his sort of historical economic um, or economic history work looked at both the natural and the social environment within which economies are instituted and then the institutions that, that would be uh, appropriate in different, uh, both social and, and uh, natural environments. Um, and so his, his idea of substantive economics really is that there are, there are distinct organizing principles of economies and that utility or efficiency or uh, maximization are not the only principles that could organize a system of exchange to meet material needs. That there could be um, equity concerns that would be dominant over efficiency. There could be redistribution. There could be emphasis on community versus individuals. So the different kind of internal logics of a system are going to reflect the social and national environment within which that system is being instituted by individual actions and, and then over time the structures that, that are created by those actions. So that's Polanyi in a nutshell. 
um, or at least a few of his ideas. Um, and then so another and much bigger, uh, much higher impact uh, contemporary theorist in the, who also comes out of this or who fits into this conflict school is Pierre Bourdieu, who uh, is a bit more contemporary, but is also like the classical theorists, has written voluminous amounts and more in French that's not been translated into English, so there's constantly new things to read in English by Bourdieu. Um, he didn't die that long ago, so there's a lot of papers that are still being put out anyway. Um, so I'm going to touch on just a few um, of his key ideas. His sort of cl classic masterpiece is a book called Distinction. One of the things he's really, in he's really interested in across all of his work, and particularly in this, this work, The Distinction, um, is really trying to understand social stratification and the different categories, so the differences across individuals and groups of individuals. Those categories being um, defined by different access to material resources, but also different access to power. And that's really where he, again, fits into this conflict, this conflict theory frame where there are differences in terms of, people, of the re resources people have access to. Those resources are not only material, and those systems are not only based on modes of production, but they're also based on other types of capitals. So he really takes this economic language and expands it out to include not just economic capital or, or material capital, land and labor, right? Um, but also to include other types of capital like social, cultural, and symbolic capital being the kind of key three. Um, and so his, his sort of um, framing of, of capitals are that there are, there are social categories um, that, we, that one can access depending on where one starts from, and that in turn gives one, that gives one the ability to leverage further power. So a really good example is if you walk into a job interview wearing a suit, that gives you a little bit of cultural capital. If, if, if it's a situation where you're supposed to be wearing a suit, like the economics meeting where you're trying to get a job, right? <laughs> you wear a suit, you have some cultural capital because in that cultural setting, that's expected. And you can then leverage that to start a conversation with the person you're hoping is going to interview you. If you're the same individual with the same record and, and brilliant mind, but you walk in wearing a hooded sweatshirt and cargo pants, they're probably not going to give you the time of day because you haven't sort of given them that cue, but really you haven't leveraged this, you don't have the cultural capital, you haven't leveraged this cultural space effectively. Maybe that's because you don't have the money to do that, and then that comes back to this question of what other resources do you have access to. Um, but the basic idea is that we have these different sort of um, abstract worlds to which we can appeal uh, differently depending on where we come from and that in turn gives us a leg up or not a leg up to continue to change those those sort of abstract or symbolic worlds. And so again this comes out of his interest in sort of broadening out the universe of exchange from only being about material exchange to being about exchange of social relationships of uh, cultural knowledge um, or for, and the symbolic capital is more about things like honor or bravery, it's a bit more um, lofty, I suppose. The other big idea, another big idea from Bourdieu, there are a few, and this is only one more, um, is this idea of habitus, which is um, very complex, and, and um, I am not an expert on it, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna try to uh, tease it all apart, but it, the basic idea is that he again draws on the dialectics that kind of do come out of, of um, the same tradition that Marx and the conflict theories come out of this dialectic interaction between objective or external reality and our internal subjective experience of that reality and how over time that back and forth mediates the structures within, within which we live and then how we therefore experience our lived reality. Um, and so it is this back and forth that um, helps to kind of, this is why he's a bit of an integrative uh, contemporary theorist because he's trying to pull together the structure and agency or the objective and subjective, both in theory and also then a lot for sociologists and for social scientists. Um, there's a lot, he writes a lot about how to do that methodologically and that's part of why I think it's, um, it's a fairly interesting perspective to, to include. Mm -hmm.